Welcome to today's webinar compiled and produced by the team at biznews.com. All of our webinars are interactive. We encourage you to pose questions to our guests. The more challenging, the better. And the earlier you get the questions in, the better the chance of having them answered. The recording of this webinar will be available later today on the biznews.com channel on YouTube. Well, there we go. Uh, it's Alec Hogg here coming to you from Cape Town. And you can see in our new little studio there at WeWork in Johannesburg is our very own Stuart Lerman. Stu, nice to see you on the other end. Yes, thanks. Alec, always good to be here. I see we, we have, it's our first day, second day in the new studio. Same same location, WeWork, just different area, as we say in the building. Still lots that needs to be done there. I hope my sound is okay. We're waiting for curtains on the wall. <laughs> All these things you learn when you, when you your first time doing a studio, I think. It's quite interesting. Cushions everywhere, et cetera, et cetera. It's quite an interesting concept to bounce sound. <laughs> yeah, it, it certainly is. And we will uh, be making that into a really zooty studio coming up on Monday as our very first broadcast here on FMR. It was great to meet the guys from Fine Music Radio in Cape Town uh, yesterday, Mark Jennings and some of his team. Uh, and it's a brand new partnership and a brand new era for us. But we are not, <laughs> that's we work. That's the only it. challenge, sorry. <laughs> uh, but at least by, where I'm staying, the uh, in, it's in Giron Novik's hotel in the home suite. We, I, I looked around and it's a fantastic price, half price uh, that they're offering it at. So I suppose it just shows what's happening with the uh, travel not being that great. And I think then then be very very uh, um, they're not going to be more of these built because this is a 12J company, and 12J is now over. It uh, we did say that it was going to end in June. That yeah. the information we were getting from Treasury was that 12J would not happen. So I'm delighted for those members of the business community who've managed to participate in Brightlight Solar's 50 million rand fundraise because that's it. You you don't get another crack at that opportunity. That's one of a lot of issues that came through in the budget today. I was in the lockup from seven o'clock. There must have been last minute changes to the speech, Stu, because we only got Tito's speech at two minutes. Well, you know, at yeah. two minutes to two. So usually what happens is that you get a, a, a bunch of documents. Um, this is one of them. So it's not, this is this is the smallest of the documents. There's a, there's a huge, a 980 page uh, tome that I leave behind because I've taken it back to Johannesburg so many times and never reopened it. But this budget review uh, is, is excellent. So I found myself working through the budget review this year for the first time rather than ordinarily, which was working through Tito's speech. And uh, what I, my, my usual process is to go through Tito's uh, or through the financial minister's speech. Uh, edit it so that we can get ready to publish it at two o'clock. I'm only allowed to send the stuff to you at one o'clock. Uh, and yeah. then you pick up all the information. But my goodness, I think I found a new way because looking at the media coverage that has come through today, I think they missed the point. I really think they missed the point. But we'll get into that in a, in a little while. Let's uh, just pick up on the technical side first, make sure everyone can actually hear us, Stu. Excellent. Thanks, Alec. Uh, those new to the webinar, there's a little control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. If you can see Alec and myself, hear my voice and see a nice presentation underneath, can you give us a high five? There's an option on the attendee list there. Uh, there we go, Alec. I've got some high fives coming through. Please just let us know. Uh, uh, the sound sounds okay, but let us know if it's a bit soft. We can increase that. And then we do like to keep it conversational. The little questions drop down bar on that same control panel. If you put your questions, I can see there's a couple coming through already. Put your questions and I'll pass them on to Alec as he goes through. But Alec, over to you to give us the, some interesting feedback. I know you did mention the corporate tax thing, which will probably come up, which wasn't in the one document in other, and that's probably why the speech was a bit late. Eh? <laughs> well, that's that's an interesting point because in all the documentation that I worked through, I could not see 
a cut in the corporate tax, you, that would jump out at you. Uh, being yeah. being Biz News, being a, a company that uh, obviously our business is to see what's happening in the corporate world. And there it was in the speech, hidden away, the corporate tax rate is going to be, has been cut from next year, well, from the 2022 um, fiscal year to 27%, from 28%. I mean, big deal, but uh, at least it's something. At least it's moving in the right direction. But maybe that was one of the issues. Uh, I need to really study that speech to see if there are other issues as well. But uh, that was the only one that I could see that didn't come up. But there's lots of other things. I'm going to put off my video now uh, because I think the slides are going to talk for themselves. And if you look at this headline slide, I really had to go back to my hero, Warren Buffett, because that encapsulates for me the whole budget. Only when the tide goes out do you discover who's been swimming naked. And I can tell you, South Africa has been swimming naked for a decade or more. And at the end of this uh, presentation, and I'll do, I'll just go through the presentation for about 10 or 15 minutes, really. Uh, at the end of this, you, I'm sure, will agree. But let me just uh, sketch the background for you. We'll get to those questions in due course, as Ju says. A uh, little question mark, click on that, and you can type your questions in. All right. Oh, now I'm hitting the wrong uh, the wrong slide, but I'm sure we'll we'll get there. There we go. Just to tell you that I was there. It was very interesting today. The last time I was in this chamber, it was the old apartheid government. Uh, and just showing my age, I was there watching Owen Horwood uh, in the early 1980s working for the Rand Daily Mail um, and seeing exactly how the uh, how the old parliament used to operate. And we actually sat in their seats, in the seats of those old parliamentarians today. So lots of social distancing. Uh, they're very strict, uh, the uh, Treasury guards. They forced us to wear our masks throughout. So even though there was no one within four meters of me, uh, I was not allowed to take my mask off. I did for a minute and uh, was quickly told off, so I put it back on. There we go. And the, the, the background to all of this, the background to what Treasury had to do this time around, was COVID-19. They're very proud in the uh, in, in the in the discussions of the document in that South Africa of emerging markets was one of the most aggressive to answer uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and as a consequence I suppose they feel that it's fairly justified that South Africa's GDP has gone down as much as it has although you would have thought that with a massive increase in government spending, which went up to nearly 42% of GDP, almost 42% of GDP uh, in this past uh, year, 2020, or the, the fiscal year to February 2021, put onto that, you know, combined with this, this massive increase in government spending, a reduction of 230 billion rand in revenues, and you got a whole uh, the size of well, where they used to mine diamonds in Kimberley. Uh, but South Africa, despite that huge increase uh, in government spending, was still one of the worst impact in, impacted in the world. Interesting to see that Nigeria is around about 3% decline, South Africa 7.2%. It, uh, was, it was looking like it was going to be even worse at many budget time. Uh, the decline was heading at 7.8%. So it got a little bit better in the second uh, or last few months. And the reason for that was a better than expected improvement in the global economy. And uh, that brought up commodity prices and actually a, a hundred billion rand more in taxes coming particularly from the mining sector. So that's the background. But this is the graph that I uh, refer to all the time. It's one we should almost have on our walls everywhere. Uh, South Africa's debt to GDP as a percentage of GDP. And this tells us that South Africa is really in a, uh, well, up a creek without, without a paddle. If you have a look back to 2009, in fact, go all the way back there to 1994. Post-1994, there was a, an increase in debt to GDP. And then very sensible management of the finances of this country, uh, saw it get down to as low as 26%. Then we had the Zuma factor and Zuma came in and he realized uh, that he didn't know anything about economics or numbers, but he knew how to spend and the way he spent was by just expanding the public service. And that 
extra money that was spent on public servants has taken has been funded through debt and the debt to gdp ratio in south africa has gone from 26 percent uh, to 54 percent by the time that zuma resigned so that was that was almost like own goals self-inflicted own goals you can only imagine what Trevor Manuel is thinking after all the hard work that he and Tabo and Becky, the president of the time, put in to get the debt down. Because remember, you start servicing the debt first uh, before you can spend any more money. And Zuma's after Zuma's resignation, uh, hospital pass came at uh, Sora Maposa in the form of COVID-19, and now there's no shock absorber. So after the the own goals were scored uh, during the Zuma era and all of these public servants were uh, of course voters for the ANC were um, deployed cadres if you like were put into place uh, then there was no shock, shock absorber and when COVID came along it's just shot up the uh, debt to GDP has gone from 60 percent where it it broke through 60 percent only last year for the very first time uh, to now 80 percent and it's going to peak in 2026 if, if uh, they are able to cut back on public sector salaries. So these numbers are now starting to look really scary, particularly because the debt is being built up at a time when interest rates are very low. So we aren't seeing the real impact of this yet. Once interest rates start rising and you've got to roll over that debt, heaven help us. Anyway, let's uh, get deeper into this presentation. You can see that's that's a, a, these are treasury figures on what interest payments at the low interest rates of the moment. And remember, these are historically low interest rates. Uh, those are the billions that are being paid in interest every year. And the average debt service cost, so it's, in other words, now uh, we are comparing ourselves with really the, the scraping the bottom of the barrel, economically speaking, no more looking at the better managed countries in the world. We're now looking at the likes of the Dominican Republic, and Philippines, and Turkey, and India. This again is from Treasury. I guess uh, it looks it look good relative to Sri Lanka and Egypt, but my goodness, um, on uh, countries that that have been performing well, South Africa is now starting to look pretty pretty uh, in very very bad shape. The fact of the matter is, it is all about the public sector wage bill. You can see the table that comes here from the Treasury documents. The real issue here is the Treasury says this is what's going to happen to debt if, if it's able to cut the public sector wage bill by 265 billion rands over the next three years. To me, this is the critical part of the whole budget. Everything is premised on the basis of a 265 billion rand cut in public sector salaries. Uh, will that happen? Well, they've never cut before. They've made all kinds of threats and, and uh, suggestions, but the unions, the public sector unions, are very powerful, not least because they're the ones who put the ANC government into office. And they're the ones who've actually been deployed there by the ANC government. And now the ANC government has to cut those wages and uh, at the at, and remember what this is not telling us that they're going to hold the wages static or the public sector wage bill static. This is talking about an actual cut in the next three years, and those are big numbers, 265 billion. Are you skeptical? I am, uh, and I think I'm I'm rightly so. I've sat in that chamber as I wrote today in our commentary piece, listening to Pravin Gordon when he was the Minister of Finance, telling us he was going to be taking five percent off the procurement budget, 25 billion rand a year, by centralizing everything and getting rid of all the wastage. And he had Kenneth Brown there as the head of procurement, a, a, a veteran from the Treasury. We were all terribly excited because this was one way of starting to get government spending under control. What happened? Pravin got fired. Uh, Kenneth Brown didn't last very long. He went off. He now works for Standard Bank. And well, uh, the procurement, we never hear a thing about it anymore. And then a couple of years ago, we had a similar story coming from Tito Mboweni, who said he was going to be implementing a highly innovative retirement package, which allows public servants to retire early. And he was anticipating that, again, they would be saving something like 25 billion a year, 25 billion a year. 
that we're talking about 265 over three years. So just think of the scale of this. And even that didn't come right. Um, the public servants thought, why give up a job when a job is the most valuable thing in the South African economy when you've got 30% plus unemployment? So it's very easy to add people, as we know in the private sector, uh, to a company. It's not that easy to let them go. And when you're in the public sector, it's nigh impossible, but that's what is being worked into all these numbers. If you take this out of the numbers, they, they, make, they become really horrifying. But Treasury has said, this is what they're aiming at. So let's get back to that interest payment. There it is, the interest as a percentage of GDP. And I, I took this graph all the way back to 1985. And as you can see, we are now approaching the worst of the worst levels. Uh, just before democracy in 1994, there was huge spending, lots of debt that was incurred. Uh, that was to try and get, try and balance the books and the Nats uh, liked a few of their pet projects, getting those through. But what would worry anybody with a rational mind is that those increases in interest payments are based on historically low global interest rates. And as I said before, when you start normalizing the interest rates, these numbers become frightening. Tito does think, or rather the merry men at the Treasury do think that those hippo jaws that he spoke so much about last year uh, are going to close. If you have a look at that, 2021, the jaws or the opening up is very large. This is being blamed on COVID. But if you look at 2020, the jaws were already very large at that point in time. In fact, the highest uh, in some years. And 2021 onwards, the anticipation is that expenditure is going to be reduced and that revenue is going to be improved. And as a consequence of that, those jaws are going to close. The problem there, and you look at that, that sharp decline in the main budget non-interest expenditure, that's the 265 billion. If they do not get that right, if the public servants say, up yours, we, we are not going to sacrifice, well, then clearly the, the top air, the, the, the lip, the top lip of the hippo's jaw is not going to close in that way, and it might continue indeed to widen. This is something else that is a graph that <laughs> reflects exactly what a state the, uh, the country is in at the moment. Again, going back this time into the 70s, South Africa's budget deficit as a percentage of GDP. Remember, there were crazy things happening in the 70s and the 80s. There were debt standstills. There was a, a, a border war that was being fought. There was national service. Uh, there were sanctions. All of those insane things. Even then, at that point in time, South Africa's debt to GDP ratio remained at a level which, which was okay for lenders. Um, somewhere between at the worst point was 7.1%, but that was just before democracy. Uh, but most of the times between 6% and uh, during the gold bull run in 1980, it got to zero. So there was no budget deficit then. But subsequent to that, it really has been going in the wrong direction. And this one, when it goes down, uh, is bad. And the 14% in this year is by far the biggest budget deficit South Africa's ever had, or certainly has had, uh, I guess, I haven't looked at the figures for the First and Second World War, but uh, in the modern era, and it is more than double as bad as where we were in 1993, remembering with historically low interest rates as well on top of it. There is a, a, a belief that the budget deficit is going to be reduced, but look where it's going to. Even by 2024, we're still gonna only be around about the worst levels ever in history. And that is cause for quite a lot of concern. Okay, there's now we're starting to compare ourselves, again, not with the countries that are managing themselves well. In the past, South Africa used to pride itself on the fact that it would be, it would qualify to join the EU if it, uh, if it was in Europe. Uh, that's how well the finances were being managed here. Now we talk about uh, being in the same league as the Philippines, uh, worse even than Brazil and Egypt and Pakistan. And there's Sri Lanka and Turkey. Uh, China's uh, average budget deficit over the next three years is very high, but they can afford it. They've got huge uh, reserves. South Africa, of course, doesn't have that.
And the reason again is these, this massively overpaid and overstaffed public sector, public servants. That is the legacy of Jacob Zuma. If you, we look at it in Kantla and uh, I did the numbers, it's costing the South Africans a billion rand in Kantla. And I do that by taking a 20 year government bond on the uh, on the cost of Inkantla, and then you work it out over the full 20 years because basically we built the house for the fella um, and that's what we're going to be paying in interest so it's a billion rand that's Inkantla's cost now you you uh, you would say that that is the a, a terrible legacy that we've got from Jacob Zuma but that's nothing compared to what he has done by inflating the public sector and inflating the salaries of the public sector in the treasury documents today they bemoan the fact that public servants have had real salary increases, real pay increases of 4% per annum for the last decade. Now, just think about that for a minute. We're talking then about an already inflated public sector where those who work for it getting, are getting 4% higher than inflation in their packages, pay packages every year, paid for by an economy that's growing at one and a half percent. Now you're going to talk about insanity and about a, a poison chalice that has been thrown by the former president to the current president. That's the one. Look at where it's taken us. South Africa's compensation of its public sector, of its public servants as a percentage of GDP, that's the way we compare one country or countries against each other, is in the same range as the Nordic countries. And we know the Nordic countries provide cradle to, to grave uh, security for people who live there and they don't mind paying those high tax rates because they get looked after by the state. This country's debt to GDP, uh, sorry, uh, uh, public servants are paid as a percentage of GDP more than 50%, more than 50% what they get in the UK and the US and think about the services they get there and double Ireland, Korea, Switzerland, Germany, Netherlands. You can see where the problem is. Treasury knows where the problem is. Tito Mboweni knows where the problem is. But are the, uh, are the politicians who cheered Tito today and laughed at his jokes, are they really aware that this is uh, South Africa's moment to start attacking the, um, the, the, this runaway train? Interest as a, as a, this graph here doesn't look too bad, but again, remember, we're talking about historically low interest rates, a couple of percentage points higher rates around the world, and that number is going to go up. And as I wrote today in my commentary, it's the Maggie Thatcher moment. You might remember in the mid 1980s, anyone who's been watching The Crown on Netflix would know this uh, immediately. In the mid 1980s, Maggie Thatcher took on the trade unions in the UK because the country was sick, it was going down, the, uh, it, it looked like uh, it, it was, the currency was under enormous pressure, the debt was just rising out of control and she realized, uh, this daughter of a grocer, that the books weren't balancing and the only way to balance the books was to attack the trade unions uh, across the board and to, to, to stop the collective bargaining which was bankrupting the country. Now, Maggie was taking on the private sector in many respects, from people like the trade unions of the, of the coal miners, etc., and you could get coal from elsewhere. What Tito and, Tre and uh, Cyril have to do is take on their own people, the people who voted them into office. They have to take on the public servants, and that's, that's going to be quite, an, quite a, a difficult thing. Why do they have to do this? Well, because let's look at the tax cake, where the revenue comes from. That's 38%. The biggest chunk of South Africa's tax comes from personal income tax. Very well. Where does personal income tax come from? Can you get more out of that stone? No, because the marginal income tax rate, there you can see it. Uh, South Africa is pretty much, uh, whereas we get compared with third world countries when it comes to uh, the the uh, state of the finances of this country, we certainly aren't compared to first uh, third world countries uh, when it comes to marginal income tax rate, uh, which as you can see there on the left hand side, uh, the third world countries, Nigeria, Egypt, 22%, uh, 23%, half of where you are in South Africa with your marginal income tax rate. So you can only get so much out of a stone. There's nowhere further to 
get tax from personal income tax payers. And when he knows this, that's why he gave a little bit back this year by addressing fiscal drag. It's really, it's better than nothing, but to adjust the uh, brackets and the uh, tax rates uh, or the ta tax tables by 5%, all it does is offset inflation. The other thing that really must be concerning Treasury and uh, anyone who looks at South Africa's finance with a sensible eye is that now only 2 million taxpayers, 3.5% of the population, pay 80% of the personal income tax. Often when I talk to uh, leaders or, or uh, business people or government people from other parts of Africa, they look at South Africa's tax base uh, with very hungry eyes and wish that they could have something similar. But South Africa, it appears, uh, just continues to attack its tax base. And when you look at this reality, at this picture, where 80% of the taxes for personal income tax, which by the way, remember, is the biggest chunk, 38% of all the taxes that come in, 80% is paid by just 2 million people. And it gets even worse when you look down the bottom at the 135,000 Rand a month plus club. These are highly skilled individuals who in fact are globally mobile. Um, they make up 0.2% of South Africa's uh, population and they pay 26% of income tax. So you can't get more rock out of more more uh, water out of that rock. On the other hand, so just look at this one for a minute. Okay, you've got call it seven million people in total uh, who do pay income tax. Uh, the vast majority, that two two million of them, uh, pay only three percent of the income tax. So that's very small. People who earn up to one hundred and fifty thousand a year. Then on the other end, you get eighteen million people, or thirty percent of the population, who receive social grants. But look at the projections. Uh, on this, looking ahead into the future, and you will see that actually that number, uh, I'm sorry, I've, I lost the, the years somehow, but the number there of 19,256, that is for 2024. So the anticipation of the government, of Treasury, is that the 18.2 million people who are having social grants at the moment is going to go up by a million people uh, in the next three years. So it's, there's nothing really that, that uh, is stopping this very serious uh, hippo uh, mouth opening exercise where the taxpayers uh, unfortunately are the top end and they're not opening the mouth. In fact, they're contracting people, emigrating, et cetera. And at the bottom end, it's just growing. I wanted to just dwell before we finish uh, very briefly uh, and go to questions on the recent recovery of the RAND. This is a very good chart that Treasury put in there showing emerging market index against the US dollar, there it is in gray, and how the RAND was one of the worst affected by the pandemic, not surprisingly, as uh, government has said on numerous occasions, it reacted very strongly against COVID-19. History will tell whether that was a smart or not such a smart uh, call, but the reality is that it affected the RAND initially, and then the RAND is now coming back to where it should be, it still be, should still be another 10% stronger just to maintain its position with emerging market currencies. And that is the end of, uh, of my presentation. So Stu, if you'd like to go to uh, a few questions. Excellent, thanks Alec, uh, great insight. Uh, Bruce, he's more comment, he says, is Tito censoring the content? <laughs> I think he's referring no, to- No, 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 Bruce, I, you know, I, I don't know why this happened today, but it I, you've just got to assume that there was something at the last minute that was put in to his speech that uh, they might not have been too keen for the rest of us to see. That's the only thing I can see. And that's really dumb because everything's in the budget review, barring that one little uh, reduction in corporate tax rate. But no, Tito, he can't censor it. We have a very proud record of being of having one of the most transparent budgets in the world is like we have a great record of having one of the best constitutions in the world. Uh, you, you can't change that. We're not China. We don't have censors sitting in our newsrooms. Thanks, Alec. Uh, Johan, it shows his question shows the global reach of business, which is quite nice. He just wants to know: Was there any more information provided on the expat tax? He's from Abu Dhabi. 
No, Johan. Um, I haven't. I didn't pick anything up when I went through the budget review, um, and I think it is a. It's one of those things right now that there are so many other priorities that it would take a very small-minded person to start chasing even more money out of the country. When you have a look at that number, we're we actually going to leave that graph up there, yeah, leave that table up there, because it really tells you. Uh, look at that. You, you you can't lose. These are these are thirty eight percent of South Africa's total tax that it receives. A lot of those people there, are registered taxpayers, would be people like you, would be expats sitting in other parts of the world. Now you want to tell them we actually don't want you anymore. It's that would be a very political decision. It's a kind of Julius Malema decision. It wouldn't be the kind of. Uh, decision that or a Jacob Zuma decision wouldn't be the kind of decision a a, a global thinker like um, or global thinkers like Soro Ramaphosa and Tito Mboweni would enact. Um, Herbert just wants to know is were there any changes announced to the property transfer duty and capital gains tax um, things Alex? No the taxes were just about left unchanged the only thing that happened with the taxes this year was the fiscal drag benefit. So fiscal drag is something that occurs with, we have a, what is called a progressive tax rate. So the more you earn, uh, the more you pay in tax and progressively more you do. So we, we would go up to a figure of 45% if you earn more than 135,000 Rand a month, 45 cents in every Rand that you earn beyond that will go straight to the tax man. Uh, when you earn less than that, the percentage that goes to the tax man of the additional income is lower. So every year, because of inflation, people generally get inflationary increases in their incomes, and that pushes them up into a higher tax bracket. And that really costs taxpayers, uh, the, the quanti that has been quantified by the Treasury, 11.5 billion rand. This year, they adjusted the tables to take care of the 11.5 billion rand, and then to add back another 2 billion rand. So they put it, call it 13 and a half billion rand that they adjusted the tables by. So this year with the salary increases, um, it doesn't mean that proportionally you're gonna pay more tax, but they haven't been adjusting fiscal drag for a while. It's a very easy way for government to, to pocket another 10 bars, no, 10, not 10 bars, it's what's it, 10,000 bars, uh, another 10 billion rand. So it's, is not um, uh, something that has been touched uh, in the past, but it was touched this time. So that's one. The second thing is that they pushed up excise duties and tobacco taxes by 8%. And I see tax justice South Africa is appalled by this because they say all they're going to be doing is making the criminals richer uh, because of the, the, the massive market now that, the, that there is in tobacco and alcohol products after the move towards prohibition during the lockdown. And the third tax change is a 400 million rand that is being allocated uh, for export on scrap metal. And that's a long overdue tax that's been implemented and uh, it, it relates to uh, an attempt to stop things like cables theft and uh, these scrap metal dealers who would buy copper cable from thieves um, to telecoms, uh, detriment, although the telecom has said it's not putting up any more fixed lines, so there's not going to be too much copper cable for too much longer. But anyway, that is uh, 400 million has been budgeted there. That's it. Uh, outside of the uh, fuel tax, which goes up, the petrol price goes up and diesel price by 26 cents a litre. Of that, 15 cents is in the fuel levy and 11 cents goes to the road accident fund. And they get me started on that one. Thanks, Alec. As Zukisa says, um, he mentioned, the minister only mentioned the bailout for the land bank. Um, do you know how much he'll pump into any of the other struggling SOEs? Yeah, he was very quiet about that. Um, there's, there was, there was mention uh, in the in the budget review about the, the the need to have a user pay uh, implemented, uh, but specifics were pretty light. Um, Marcus wants to know, he said, how much of today's budget do you think had an eye on the next elections? None, because the next elections 
if you if you're going to try and win the next election you aren't going to be cutting public sector salaries uh, i think a lot of this had to do with the fact that the tide has receded and south africa has been swimming naked for 10 years now the big trick here is to get south africans to understand this uh, if if we were economically literate as a nation uh, we would be saying right now that, that we can't afford public servants much less uh, the kind of low service delivery that we get from many public servants in South Africa some brilliant public servants um, the state prosecutors uh, are an excellent example but there are also and of course the doctors who work in hospitals there are many people who who serve this country magnificently but there are unfortunately um, they, they're overrun or massively outnumbered by those who don't and if you are talking about an election budget then an election budget like the old national party used to do was where you increase the salaries to public servants so that you get them you get their votes in the bag you don't say we're going to take 265 billion rands in the next three years from our wage bill Thanks, Alec. Brian just wants to know if, if there was any amendment to the foreign investment allowance of 10 million rand. No, no, there was nothing that I saw. It could have, uh, no. There was, uh, it's almost certainly, where, where there was uh, a, a notable amendment was on 12J, which we mentioned right in the beginning of the program, where the view was that 12J is only benefiting rich South Africans. And as a consequence, it's the rest of the tax base that is actually paying for it but when you i mean that is so hypocritical on so many levels but when you just start off here by looking at two million people the rich south africans for 80 percent of the income tax after 12j <laughs> i mean really you know get real i think that 12j one has stirred a lot of pots alec especially within our community it's been a great um, avenue for investment but who knows but it keeps the money in the country, Stu. That's the point. Uh, it it increases the what they're complaining about in in Treasury. They're saying that uh, so much of the 12J money has gone into low risk investments, and it hasn't created a lot of jobs. So just eliminate that. Stop people from investing uh, using 12J for low risk investments. But don't don't throw the baby out with the bathwater on something that has raised billions of rands that stay in South Africa rather than going out and doing it because you, you're not prepared to embrace the complexities of something. And then on the other side, as I wrote in my commentary, and this is my particular bugbear, we are subsidizing to the tune of, I don't know how many hundreds of billions of rands, but it's, it's of that order. The motor manufacturers in South Africa have a look at what you pay for a car in this country. And in our neighboring states, it's 30% cheaper. 30% cheaper. You may not bring a car into South Africa from Mozambique or uh, Botswana or, in fact, anywhere else in the world. Why? Because we subsidize the motor industry in this country by paying 30% more for our cars than we should be. And the reason for that is that you've got a few hundred thousand people who work for motor companies and they are being protected by the motor industry development program. Some, when you have a look at Ford Motor Company investing a billion dollars into South Africa at a time that everybody else is running away with their capital, you've got to ask yourself, are they doing it because they love this country or are they doing it because they have a massive subsidy? And so when you look at that subsidy relative to something small like 12J, which really does help small and medium enterprises and can be refined, You've just got to shake your head and say, these politicians are just playing politics. Agreed, Alex. Thanks. I, I know that Ford investment uh, did uh, raise a few hairs. It was a couple of months ago. Um, just on the tax-free savings uh, investment accounts, Alex Shaman wants to know if there were any changes in regards to those. I know it used to be, it was 36,000 a year. I think I'm not sure if there's a change on that side. I didn't see it, uh, but remembering that I only had a few hours in lockup this morning, so I haven't had a chance to go through all the detail, but it is one of those things I would presume that if it was changed, they'd be trumpeting 
and I didn't see anything, any trumpeting on, on that score. But uh, if so, and we'll be working through the detail the next few days, we will be sure to let you know. Thanks, Alec. Ciswe has pulled out a, a, a quote and wants to ask what it means. It says, from 1 March 2021, specific rules for companies with a primary listing offshore, including dual listed structures, will be aligned to current foreign direct investment rules. This change will be applied automatically to affected companies once Reserve Bank has finalized these arrangements. I'm not sure if that makes any sense on your side. Alec. No, Ciswe is being very unfair. <laughs> 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 Even if I'd read the same paragraph, I don't know what it means at all. I think that's the kind of thing we're going to have to talk to our investment bankers about and, and ask them exactly what it means. Sorry, I, I wish I could help, but uh, outside my circle of competence. Thanks, Alec. Um, Johan wants to know, given all of this, what is the solution, either economically or politically? Well, the solution is very clear. South Africa needs to become financially disciplined. It needs to attack the white anting of its country. And if it doesn't do that, it will go the way of Zimbabwe. Now, I mean, those are big words. It's big statements. But you cannot continue to borrow indefinitely. And that is what we're doing. That is what we've been doing. You have to, at some point in time, say, our debt is too high. We now need to start not increasing it anymore. And the way to not increase it anymore when you haven't got additional revenue coming in is to cut your costs, not to continue to escalate them. And that is exactly what Treasury has said. South Africa is blessed. Uh, I love that interview uh, with Bobby Godsell and the Alec Hogg show some, some time ago, where he said, we are blessed by our people and cursed by our leaders. And we are blessed with these, with the, the, the incredible people who work at National Treasury. These are among the most skilled individuals that you'll find working for any state in the world. Dondo Mogajani and uh, the DG there and, and, and his team, they know exactly what's going on. They are highlighting these, these issues and they have a record of doing that and having done that for a long time. So it's not a question of we think and we don't know what's happening. We know exactly what's happening. It's a question of how do you get the politicians to realize they must stop buying votes? And if they don't stop buying votes, we will end up as a tin pot country. And that's not what South Africans want. I believe that the most likely move, however, is not going to be to grasp the nettle, certainly not in the short term, although Ramaphosa uh, is a man with, 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 who, has, who should have all of our confidence. He is an incredibly smart guy who understands exactly what he's dealing with, and he is navigating through massive complexities. And if anyone's going to get through them, he's going to get through them. Don't underestimate the man. And if you, you do, go and listen to that uh, audio book uh, that I read of Anthony um, uh, what the the oh, Anthony Butler, uh, the professor, yeah, the professor from UCT, that uh, biography on Ramaphosa. Just go and listen to it, and you will see that he's the man made for the moment. But on, in reality, it's maybe impossible to do that. You know, we're still listening to the the uh, the, the popular press shouting about Ace Magashule and the Zuma faction, etc. There's still a perception. And I, I'm not close enough to the politicians to, in fact, they're gratefully so, uh, to to know how much truth in it uh, is in it. But there's a perception that the these useful idiots may indeed take over the country again. Well, I, I would I would hate to think that that was a, a, even a possibility, but the popular press seems to suggest that that is the case. But having said that, if there's even a smidgen of truth in it then the way that has been played in South Africa for years and possibly going to be continued with is just to try not to let things go completely out of kilter and hope that something comes and rescues us, as it does time and time again. In the 80s, it was the gold price. Uh, now we've got the battery metals that are coming through. And of course, we've got the, the, the gas find off the Southern Cape coast. Total had, a, had a, their second. They can only really drill there for one month of a year in February. 
So we're very interested to see what happened this year. But uh, in the last two years, they've had two very big strikes there. And we should be hearing in the near future, uh, because the seas are so rough, you can't drill there uh, year round, but it'll be very interesting to hear what's happened. And who knows, maybe the politicians already know that there's another big uh, strike that's gone there already. What we do have off the Southern Cape Coast is, uh, is a bonanza, bonanza of note. We also have lots of minerals in this country, which are perfectly suited for the boom that's coming in electric uh, vehicles, uh, none of which, by the way, are being built in South Africa by these highly subsidized international motor manufacturers. You've got to ask a big question there as well. How well did we negotiate that? Uh, anyway, but who knows? Maybe maybe we will be rescued again. We're the lucky, we are the real lucky country. It's every time we we up a creek without a paddle, something comes to uh, to rescue us and maybe another one's uh, just around the corner. Thanks, Alec. Uh, Stuart wants to ask, um, can you please show the pie chart indicating the contribution of the different taxes and if you think new taxes would potentially help? Yeah, sure, sure, uh, Stuart. Uh, there we go. Um, yeah, that one, yeah. As you can see, that's 38%. Uh, that's the one uh, I, I took the latest figures from today's a budget. So where would the new taxes come from? Hmm. Well, you, you've maxed out on personal income tax. VAT at 25% is already a very big chunk. Can you increase it from 15%? Well, after the last increase from 14 to 15, they promised never to do it again. And the trade unions did grumble. Can you imagine now you're telling the trade unions, especially the government trade unions, that they can't have salary increases. And by the way, you're also going to be getting rid of people. Uh, can you imagine the opportunity if you decide on top of that to increase that? So that's not going to come through. Corporate income tax has been reduced from 20, 28 to 27%. So that's not going to grow either. Uh, fuel levies have, uh, are pretty much topped out. There's not much more you can do on that in the short term uh, if they can get the road accident fund sorted. But that again, the road accident fund, and this is something that boggles the mind. Every year we put billions of rands into the road accident fund. Every time you fill your car up, 11 cents a litre that you're paying goes into the road accident fund. And who benefits from the road accident fund? Well, uh, we call them ambulance chasing lawyers. They're having quite a good time of it. But why do we have so many accidents in this country? Why do we, with one tenth of the number of vehicles on the road of a country like the UK, have the same number of accidents? What, what's going and and many times more fatalities? What's happening? Again, I'll come back to that motor industry development program. Because cars are so expensive, 30% more expensive here than they should be than the rest of the world, people are forced to drive cars for longer. And if they drive cars for longer, they are more dangerous. If you go to Dubai, you'll see after a year they get rid of their cars because they start becoming less safe. In South Africa, we're driving cars that are 20, 30, 40 years old because it's an economic issue and on top of being a third world country. So all of these things are related. When you start subsidizing in one area, you can't ignore the unintended consequences of that in other areas as well. So will the fuel levy, maybe if, if somebody comes to their senses on the road accident fund, eventually, one day perhaps, uh, that could be a, a, an improvement there and all the money that, that the fuel levy uh, all of that goes into the tax cake. Uh, customs and excise, when exports improve and imports improve, as they must after a very bad 2020, those could get, get better as well. But where else? Uh, you can't really jack up capital gains tax anymore. You've got a tiny tax base that is already threatening to take its money offshore and then might even take itself offshore as well. So you're between a rock and a hard place if you are trying to get more tax revenue. Where you've got to work is reducing the money you spend. Thanks, Alec. Uh, David says, scrap the minimum wage and employ more. <laughs> if only it was so simple. Eh? Well, yeah, it, it's, um, that's, I don't know who, which of the politicians would implement something along those lines, but it, it's kind of obvious, but it's not politically palatable because of a perception that those who have voted you into power 
uh, have been abused by the previous regime and if you drop the minimum wage they're going to be abused in future the problem is if you're a socialist you really think that the capitalists are all bad you don't get the market system that if you're a bad capitalist you go out of business anyway that the only capitalist who is going to have a sustainable business is somebody who's actually putting back into society and when you look at the south african society my word uh, the the people who are capitalists in this country have got so many options and yet they love the place and they stay here and we all you know we we are south africans and these are our problems and we're going to deal with them but it would be nice to perhaps get people to look at things differently uh, on minimum wages there are special dispensations for certain sectors uh, there are export processing zones where they don't apply i know in moy river uh, where I farmed for some time, there was a big company there called Moy River Textiles that went bust. The Taiwanese came in and they did a deal with the uh, with the ANC that they didn't have to pay minimum wages. Uh, they only employed a fraction of what the old Moy River Textiles did where they were forced to pay minimum wages, but uh, they're continuing to produce, um, but with very few, much fewer people. So the hypocrisy of politicians is something that we we should never underestimate it is it's a reality and our job as uh, as as the the court of public opinion as the media who expose these things and this is every i believe everybody's job in south africa is to talk about these things discuss them think about them and put the pressure on the politicians because the only thing politicians are really interested in is retaining power so uh, the, if if you expose the hypocrisy, the the uh, the danger, the risk is the risk to the retention of power uh, is uh, is growing, and as a consequence, the hypocrisy reduces. That's the way a, a, a democracy works. But in our country, I guess we a young democracy, and we're still learning. Thanks, Erica. I had a few requests on the name of the book. Um, it's Sir Ramaphosa, The Road to Presidential Power by Anthony Butler. Anthony Butler. And it is on yeah, the Business News I Owner channel. If you need to tell a story about that, because um, although I read it and it took me three months to put it together, uh, with all the other obligations, I've really been pretty naughty and not updated uh, a chapter a week, which is our deal with the publishers. But now we've got Justin um, Ray Roberts, our colleague, and he's going to be doing the updating. So you can be sure, Stu, that it's going to <laughs> those those yes. Monday updates. So we'll go along it. on a Monday download and go and listen to it. It's, it's the, the it's latest really... one has. Yeah, it did go live this week. The, I think it's chapter twelve. I think is where we ended. So yes, we have started that process again, Alec. Um, yeah, Letitia, sorry, Letitia just wanted to know if what is the scenario, I think you showed the graph, if none of the 265 billion on government employee salaries is saved. Yeah, that's, uh, and that really is the important part of it. Let's, let's go back to that graph because that's what it's all about. Um, this is the graph that matters. You can see that the expansion there, the red line, and now remember, this is non-interest expenditure. So it's got nothing to do with the repayment of debt. And that's uh, sitting at mm, 270 billion Rand a year. Okay, so on top of it. So non-interest expenditure, um, which is mainly public servants uh, salaries, about 60% of it. And then down the bottom is revenue. So let's just say revenue were to recover. Then you would still, the gray line, you'd still be looking at, at best, 26% of GDP in the next few years. But if non-interest expenditure is not reduced, uh, it's at 30% at the moment. Uh, of course, there was extra spending this year because of COVID, but take it down to 28 to 29%. You've got three percentage points of GDP, which is, it's got, an, it, and it's important to realize this, this has got nothing to do with the interest that you've got to pay on top of it, but it's three percentage points more that you're spending than you're getting in. Now, GDP in South Africa is near as damn it to, uh, what's it, five trillion rand. Okay, so you take three percent of that, and that will put you, that'll give you an understanding of how much you're going backwards every year that you've got to borrow to just keep the place going. 
and those are the realities of where we are. So unless there is a reduction in the public sector wage bill, you're going to have the 3% of GDP. It's like three cents of every rand that is spent in South Africa in a year that you're going to have to borrow to keep the government going. And the only way out of that, because you can't keep borrowing indefinitely, is that something comes along that you don't know about that boosts your revenue through the roof. And maybe that's a commodity price boom or maybe that's the, the gas fines, although that's going to take a while to come through. There's going to have to be some, some Hail Mary pass that actually wins and comes off. It's like a goalkeeper scoring a goal uh, in a Premier League in, in England. It doesn't happen often, but it can happen. And I guess when, you, when you're faced with, uh, when you're between a rock and a hard place and you, you don't have the backbone uh, that is required uh, to actually push through, then that's your, that's your strategy. You just hope for a Hail Mary. Thanks, Alec. I know Jackie spoke to Magnus earlier and he said we got very lucky with the commodities run. It saved us from tax pain, but we're still in big trouble. <laughs> just to add well, to well, that. On oh, 100 billion. It, it was it, indeed. Uh, it wasn't just commodities, but it was, uh, it, it, it was also the opening up of the economy. But from four months ago, there was a 100 billion rand difference. And in fact, in this budget, they've also taken away the 40 billion that they were going to tax us with um, because of uh, a concern that that is going to uh, cause even greater economic deterioration. And that's really the thing that we, we've got to get, a, get our heads around. When you get to a point where you've squeezed as much as you can out of a stone, when you squeeze a little more, you break it. And that's the situation South Africa's in. You can't squeeze more out of these taxpayers. Uh, they they are by any standards, and you saw the the numbers relative to other parts of the world. The taxpayers are already in this country paying over the odds for the sunshine. The public servants are being paid way over the odds relative to others in the rest of the world. The answer, as Treasury keeps uh, tells us many times in this in this very lengthy document that it gives us every year, the answer is clear. Treasury knows. Cyril knows, Tito knows, but uh, does the caucus know? And if the caucus knows, is the caucus prepared to accept it? It's interesting times coming. Thanks, Alec. It's, it's amazing how quickly time flies. We're almost up with the hour. Um, Bagash just wants to know, how do you define a failed state? That's probably a good place to, to stop, but um, what is the definition of a failed state? Gee, I guess, you know, you talk, ask someone like R.W. Johnson and he would say we way along that road to a failed state. Uh, what, is a fa what is a state, I guess, is the way that, that I would uh, answer something like that if, if, if I were to apply my mind to it. And a state is a place that keeps you safe, is a place that, uh, that you pay in return for, for that privilege. It, it levels the playing field so that you're not abused by vested interests. Uh, it ensures that you can have a safe, productive and, and happy future uh, and that you can bring your children up in a, a similar way that they too can, can make a future in that country. So I guess there are different definitions. The Somalis, of course, would have a very different definition to that one. Um, and I guess the Lebanese too and so on. But that is essentially when you live in a democracy, you have the right, you have the power, you the people have the ability to to change that. And we are blessed by our people, as Bo Bobby Godsell says. So our great hope, I guess, in this country is that we finally realize 25 plus years in that we're a democracy and we have the power as the people. And if the politicians are told by the voting public what is acceptable and what isn't, the invested interests like the public sector trade unions who've, who've really run roughshod over the ANC politicians for decades now, they will also have to come to the party. It's a, it's, it's a fascinating world we live in, uh, particularly now that we have so much information that everybody is clever. Everybody on this webinar tonight has got so much more information than we had 
10 years ago, 15 years ago as journalists, and we were supposed to have most of the information. So it's a, it's a, it's a complex world, embrace complexity, uh, I believe, and keep an open mind and hope, because it's good to be skeptical, but to be cynical is uh, one way to depression and i don't want to be depressed i don't i think life's too short to go that way so let's be let's be skeptical about these numbers let's keep watching let's keep hoping and let's cheer when good things are done uh, and um, and and highlight when we feel as a community as a, as taxpayers as democrats that our leaders are not doing what we would like them what we would mandate them to do and we do it that way, this will be a thriving democracy into the future. Excellent. Thanks. That's a good place to end. I know I just need to obviously thank our sponsors, Brighter, for um, for everything they've allowed us to do today. I think it's all due to them to get you down to Cape Town and enjoy. I know it's been a long day on your side as well. Um, so thanks to you as well, Alec. No, it's not a long day. It's a great day. I mean, it's fantastic. <laughs> how do you get the opportunity to go and say, I mean, how many people have actually sat in in that old house of assembly. Wow, I mean, what a privilege, you know? And I, I'm doing my job, why? But I agree with you. Uh, thanks to Suzanne and, and her team at Bright Rock. They are the most phenomenal partners. And we've been, they've supported Biz News right from day one. So they're part, as much a part of the success story as, uh, as everybody else, like Stuart and Jackie and Jeanette and the team, Clive and the, the whole team at Biz News. Um, that you know who show up every day and and, and keep serving you uh, but bright rock without their support well we wouldn't be where we are there's no doubt about that so thanks suzanne and your team and uh, thank you to the hundreds of people who once again turned up tonight to listen to uh, the, <laughs> the the fresh view on on what happened in the budget uh, and let's keep hoping but remain skeptical thank you Thank you for joining us for this webinar, which is compiled and produced by the team at biznews.com. A recording of this webinar will be available later today on the biznews.com channel on YouTube. From our team, until the next time, cheerio. Thank mm -hmm. you.